Hello again, this is Dolores Cannon with the Metaphysical Hour. And uh, I just want to tell you, I was out of town last week, but I was in New Mexico, and it was really a very rare opportunity. I was uh, giving my hypnosis class at the college uh, in New Mexico. It was just outside of Santa Fe. It's the Northern um, New Mexico College up at El Rito that was their out campus that they had outside of Santa Fe. And I thought it was a great honor for them to ask me to come and teach because everyone who took that class got one and a half college credits for the three-day class. And I think that's really wonderful. And, you know, I've told you before when I was going on, this is the only college in the United States that is giving a four-year co um course in natural medicine and alternative healing, and I think it's fantastic that they're doing that. Anyone who takes the four-year course will have a BS, a Bachelor of Science, and they've asked me to uh, be with them. They are giving courses in aromatherapy, homeopathy, acupuncture, all kinds of natural healing, and uh, we had about 40 people in the class, and I thought it was fantastic and they asked me to come back again next semester. The only thing I didn't like was the altitude. <laughs> uh, me and altitude just don't get along. It was um, almost uh, 8,000 feet where we had to go, and it took several days to get used to that. And then it's very dry because it's out in the desert. But still, it was a fantastic weekend, and I did get to do the course and anybody who is interested in my courses, my cl uh, classes that I give, you can go on my website and find out where the next ones are going to be. Next weekend, I'll be doing one in Atlanta. And I'll be doing a book signing there at the Phoenix and Dragon Bookstore. So if you go on my website, you can find all these things out. I've got three classes in May. The other one will be in New Jersey, in Newark, and then out to San Jose. But my website is www.ozarkmountain, that's O-Z-A-R-K-M-T dot com. I heard those people out of the country, it's O-Z-A-R-K-M-T dot com. All right, now I've got a guest tonight, and he's one of the authors we have published, and his book is doing very well, so I want to let everybody get to know about him. The author is Don Shorn, and he has written the books called The Elder Gods of Antiquity, and it's part of a three-volume set that uh, we're, well, we're already, I just got through proofreading the second volume, so it looks like we're probably going to be having an ongoing series from this man. He has done a tremendous amount of research, and I really respect that because I love research. I love it when somebody does their homework. But Don is going to be on tonight. He's going to talk about his book and talk about himself. You're there, aren't you, Don? I sure am. Hi, Dolores. And thank you okay. so much for inviting me to your program. Okay. I think the book's only been out of really a few months. We published it this year, didn't we? It started the, uh, the in early January. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. So it's, uh, it's been at the bookstores, and it's doing very well. Uh, but, Don, I would like to start out by letting people know about you. Tell me about your background and how you got into all of this. Well, um, I am a uh, graduate of mechanical engineer, and um, I was at, very candidly, I was browsing one day in, in a bookstore and read a back cover um, a blurb that um, uh, indicated uh, ancient texts Proof existence of uh, uh, ancient astronauts visiting Earth uh, in our distant past, and um, uh, the word "proof" um, really, really hit me strongly. So I wanted to uh, very candidly find out for myself, and it um, it started really as a lark. I started doing some research, and uh, the research, very candidly, Dolores seemed to get out of control. It was uh, such an interesting uh, uh, journey that I, I uh, embarked upon that um, uh, it, it just fed upon itself. And, uh, you know, nine years later, I had no intent at the start, at the onset of, uh, of this 
little quirk to uh, ever write a write a book, or let alone uh, a trilogy, um, about the topic of ancient astronauts. But uh, once I did get into the uh, the material and uh, the wealth of information, finding that uh, there are many many uh, inconsistencies and flaws with our current theories. Um, it, it just uh, it became self perpetuating and uh, you know ended up um, writing a book. Uh-huh. So it, it turned out it wasn't a lark after all. It became a career, really. It, it, I it very much so. I uh, I had planned uh, after my early retirement, uh, uh, Dolores, to uh, to start a second career in writing. But at that particular time, in uh, well, very candidly, it was August of uh, 1996 when this happened. Um, I had uh, I had not picked out a particular topic, um, you know, uh, to to pursue in the writing. So uh, and and at the onset, uh, it did not appear as though the um, the ancient texts, uh, the ancient history of Earth, uh, early uh, human development, and so forth, uh, would be that topic. But like I said, the more I got into the uh, um, the research, uh, the more it uh, it captured me, and uh, um, it, it just it became phenomenally interesting and uh, surprising to me how much uh, really we we don't know about our ancient past. I know because you know as a writer myself, fascinating when you can you get into a topic you really love and you can get absorbed in. That's the wonderful part. You know, of being a writer, and I love research, too. You know, and I've written about the same topic, but you have really, you were coming to the same conclusions, but we come from different directions. And you have gotten yours from your research, haven't you? I, I have. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I, I was also surprised, uh, pleasantly surprised, uh, Dolores, when we, when we talked in 2006, and, um, you know, we started comparing notes and from an entirely different perspective, from entirely different sources, we seem to come up with uh, virtually uh, a very, very compatible uh, um, history of, of uh, Earth's ancient past and um, extremely similar uh, conclusions. Uh-huh. Well, that's what um, I always like it when somebody says, well, where's your proof? Well, I said, now we can go to your books for the proof. But the first book, uh, The Elder Gods of uh, Antiquity, that mostly deals with artifacts and things like that, isn't it? That you go it, way back to, pr- to prove that they have been here before? It, it does, uh, Dolores. Uh, again, it's, it's not really proof, it's, uh, it, but it is it suggestive is evidence. <laughs> I, um, I, I tend, as an engineer, I, I tend to be uh, a little bit of a, a skeptic uh, by nature, and uh, hence, I, I prefer to uh, very, very deeply analyze a topic before coming to any conclusion. So uh, I, I choose not to make uh, fantastic claims, uh, um, and, and especially with dealing with the ancient past or uh, um, extraterrestrial beings, UFOs, uh, things of that uh, that fact or uh, that nature. Only facts, uh, um, you know, are, are offered. Uh, that are then accompanied by uh, my personal conclusions um, that that are suggestive um, of you know uh, of the extraterrestrial visitations that I I write about. Well, see, that's what I've noticed uh, in the first book, especially. You find a lot of things that people just don't know about, but you know, be, the, uh, the history of Earth is not at all the way they say it is, and, and I've always believed that. But uh, like Eric von Donica, you know, he used to find anomalies, too. But it's the idea that you have found things that the average person doesn't know about, and I've never seen in any other book. So do um, you want to tell us about some of those things? Well, I, I, I would be happy to, uh, Dolores. Go ahead. Um, we let, we let can me... whet the audience's air, uh, appetite. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. So, sounds good. Let, let me start off with... Uh, Kind of some uh, nebulous uh, concepts, and then I'll get into some hard uh, um, uh, artifacts that okay. uh, that we'll, we'll tie together at the end. Um, uh, the, the nebulous um, aspect uh, kind of ends up being, uh, um, 
you know, again, coming from the review of, of uh, Earth's ancient record, uh, uh, specifically, let me give a little background, uh, Dolores. The, the first dinosaur bone uh, was found in the early 1800s, and uh, it consisted only of a single fossil. Additional bones were, uh, you know, discovered over the ensuing years, but the first skeletal construction occurred much later. Prior to that time, modern man would not have known how the many different dinosaur species would have looked. Uh, however, uh, there are enigmatic uh, illustrations uh, that vastly predate uh, uh, our knowledge, our first knowledge of these terrible lizards, and uh, were drawn in ancient times. And they accurately show uh, the various different species of dinosaurs that supposedly became extinct 65 million years ago. In you know, prehistoric that, time... Oh, I'm sorry, Dolores, go ahead. I, in, I know that's interesting that some of these drawings were found in caves where they were. people keep saying dinosaurs and humans didn't exist at the same time. But a human had to have drawn them in the caves. That, that is precisely correct, Dolores. Um, we, we find... Uh, um, uh, not only in in caves, but uh, on rock faces, uh, in canyons, uh, and and so forth. And they're found really around the world. It's not, um, um, you know, concentrated in any one area. It seems to be uh, again throughout the uh, the the world. Um, we have we have canyon painting, uh, canyon carvings uh, yeah. in Arizona. Um, that depict uh, um, a human about to be attacked by a Tyrannosaurus Rex. And then we have uh, a Rhodesian uh, uh, Bushman drawing uh, of a cave painting of a Brontosaurus. And that dates back to sometime between 30,000 and 15,000 B.C. Wow. And uh, you, you were speaking of uh, uh, more direct ties with, with humans, period, uh, over and above the, the drawings, uh, a related oddity in Texas uh, found fossilized human footprints along with dinosaur prints within the same strata layer. Yes, I talked and, to a uh, man who lived down there, and he said there's a museum that I think is built around one of those so people could see it. I've, I've heard of that, yeah. Uh -huh. and, and again, uh, the, the same type of thing has happened, uh, um, well, in, in southwestern Asia. Uh, in 1983, uh, um, the, the fossilized uh, human footprint was found next to uh, a print of a three-toed dinosaur. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, reports of the, you know, hominoid, uh, again, uh, it's pretty hard to, to say for certain it was uh, a true human, uh, let alone, a, you know, a modern-type human. But uh, reports of uh, humanoid footprints with dinosaur prints in the same strata are somewhat common. Uh, you're not going to find them everywhere, but, you know, it's, it's not the rarity that it would appear. Uh, but together, they may have uh, explanations other than the coexistence of the two species. However, that possibility uh, should not be excluded when visitation by extraterrestrial human-like beings are considered. So, um, you know, it's, it's anyone's guess but um, um, one, one thing I, I do want to point out why we're on the dinosaurs and footprints and, you know, the tie-in with humans, um, uh, strata layers can become mixed due to, uh, you know, tectonic plate movements, uh, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, and so forth, but they don't become mixed by, by tens of millions of years. So if dinosaurs did indeed die out 65 million years ago, uh, Regardless of the amount of, of tectonic plate movement, you're not going to mix later humanoid, humanoid uh, footprints with, uh, with dinosaur prints. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's why we don't know if it's extraterrestrial or if it's, you know, what it is. But it's definitely it, exactly. It, it's, uh, it, it certainly continues to remain a mystery. But like I said, uh, the actual coexistence of a humanoid being with dinosaurs can't be eliminated if you consider extraterrestrial visit visitors. Yeah. Okay, now, so you, were, you said you were going to go on then with another... I, I would, 
Sure. Just just going to just going to say that uh, besides the more nebulous um, uh, oddities and mysteries that uh, that we have in our past, uh, we have hard uh, evidence, uh, and these are called uh, you know anomalous artifacts, um, you know that that seem to surface consistently over the years. Yeah. Um, in in 1877, a polished iron nickel alloy metal block was found embedded in a Miocene coal seam located in a mine high in the Austrian Alps. Uh, this this square prism object measured about two and three quarter inches by two and three quarter inches by two inches, and had a machine groove around its periphery. With two faces perfectly rounded at its at its corners, uh-huh. and uh, the the object the object was later featured in an uh, 1885 issue of the journal Nature, a very prestigious uh, journal, and put on display in the Salzburg Museum until it was misplaced and disappeared around 1910. Oh, I wonder and, what happened to it. Well, that that's just it. No one knows. Uh, I have. Uh, you know, some speculative uh, hunches. Uh, uh-huh. it, it became a difficult object to actually um, uh, describe to people that by, by the scientific community. So uh, normally, I'm not saying that's what happened here, but normally objects of that nature tend to find their way um, into the deepest crevices of uh, the basement uh, of museums and storage rooms and, and so forth. Uh, again, that that's speculation, and I I choose not to speculate. Yeah, but one one thing about this this block, um, it um, its its recorded mass should have been more than twice what it was if it was solid. And uh, although th- this block has been discussed uh, by by some uh, authors in the past, um, it has never been mentioned or calculated out. In my, in my case. Um, uh, that the object was not solid. Uh, its 785 gram weight suggests a hollow or chambered interior, oh. perhaps housing more complex items. Uh-huh. And I'm going to tie that uh, together with some other of the, the more tangible uh, anomalous uh, artifacts that, um, that that we'll we'll discuss. By the way, a very similar steel block was also found in an Austrian. Uh, foundry in 1885. This is a different block. Uh, it was partially encased in a coal lump and was found very candidly by the uh, the foundry owner's son as he passed by this big uh, uh, chute of coal. He noticed this strange object, uh, you know, embedded in the uh, the coal lump, and uh, it was a very very similar uh, a block to the, uh, the the one I just mentioned. It was just slightly smaller. It was about two and five eighths inch by two and five eighths inch by about an inch point eight five in in length, and uh, it also displayed the uh, same machined uh, uh, a groove with two opposite faces uh, rounded. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, it too ended up going missing after it was uh, put on display in uh, in the Linz uh, Museum. Uh huh. Um, the, the 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 article obviously was of artificial origin. It was produced by some intelligent being. Uh, but both blocks were found in coal veins from the Miocene strata of the tertiary coal period, uh, which makes it between 12 and 26 million years old. Um, steel mills, tool shops, and skilled machinists did not exist millions of years ago. That's At true. least not on planet Earth. Uh huh. Well, now that's what we found though anything that doesn't fit the the classification, you know, of the scientists that fit what their theories, uh, it's an anomaly. Anomaly, so they have to. They just don't include it. You well, so so often there. that's that's the case, Dolores. Yep. Now, um, I, kind of a, a similar, well, I, I shouldn't even say a similar object. Uh, another anomalous uh, artifact was found in Massachusetts in 1851. It was a, a bell-shaped cone uh, that was found embedded in solid granite after blasting operations had split the stone. 
Um, it, it also was of artificial uh, construction from a metal alloy, and uh, it, was, it was, well, it measured about six and a half inches at its base, tapering to two and a half inches at the top uh, of its uh, a four and a half inch height. And uh, uh, over and above that, uh, that cone, um, there, there, there have been gold threads, extruded gold threads found embedded in solid stone by workers cutting in uh, uh, also uh, on, uh, well in an England uh, a quarry um, that too came from the uh, the Miocene uh, stratum that uh, that formed 12 to 26 million years ago and similar finds were found in tertiary coal seams where a manufactured gold chain was embedded in the Pennsylvania coal deposit with another 10-inch long gold chain found in 1881, excuse me, 1891, I believe. Yeah. Um, obviously, both were made before the coal deposit, making them, uh, you know, millions of years old. Um, the, the, these, these types of, of anomalous artifacts may somehow be connected. Uh, consider that um, the machine metal cubes, uh, that were found in Europe, in, in Austria, may have been components of a, detach, of a detachable sensor pack or possibly, uh, you know, individualized targeting devices. Again, this is purely speculative, but uh, what, uh, what were these items for, <laughs> you know, is, is always a big question. Uh, their hollow or chambered uh, interior construction tends to support the possibility that other instrumentation may have been housed within the blocks, and uh, hence their intended purpose uh, may have been to gather and analyze mineral deposits or soil samples uh, sent here as, uh, uh, you know, landers, uh, probes, sensors, whatever. Uh, the cone-shaped chalice that was embedded in the Massachusetts granite uh, may have been a portion of an outer casing, uh, perhaps a heat shield uh, for a space probe um, or, you know, sensor, whatever, for those blocks. Um, the anomalous uh, gold thread uh, may have been, uh, you know, part of the wiring within such a, um, you know, an extraterrestrial uh, uh, probe uh -huh. and, um, you know, used for various uh, electronic packages, uh, um, the power pack and, and so forth uh, for the internal uh, componentry. The manufactured gold chains uh, may have been grounding straps or power cords. Um, well, you know, there's also... It's a shame that they disappeared because with our technology today, I don't know if we could X-ray metal, but I think we could certainly find out if there if it was hollow and there was anything inside of it. Oh, there, there's there's no question that um, that it was hollow because of its we, density. Now, with our, with our technology today, though, we might have been able to find a lot more. No, no, no question about that, Dolores. Uh, um, uh, much would be. Uh, um, available to us uh, in in the form of additional information today. Yeah. So uh, it's it's disappointing that such um, valuable uh, artifacts simply disappear. Well, you know, but, I also remember in the book that you talked about David Hatcher Childress, and I've had him on my show. He's a good friend of mine, and I mentioned exactly. what you, said, you know about um, how there was a lot of artifacts found in the Grand Canyon. I believe that's what it was, and you said they had disappeared into the Smithsonian Institute somewhere. That, that is also correct. Uh, that, that was from a, um, uh, early 1900s. I, I, from memory, it was around 1909, if, if I'm not mistaken, um, um, archaeological uh, dig in the, uh, in the Grand Canyon. And uh, um, the, they, 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 the Egyptian artifacts that were found with that uh, expedition uh, simply disappeared and uh, never talked about again. And, uh, uh, you know, numerous other anomalous artifacts have been deliberately uh, uh, mislabeled, hidden, ignored, suppressed, undervalued, or discarded uh, as extraneous. Um, you know, and, and one of the Big, one of the common uh, uh, traits 
uh, museums uh, tend to do with anomalous artifacts that uh, defy um, true explanation, they label them as toys or religious artifacts. Huh. And hence, uh, well, no one knew uh, what possibly uh, uh, these particular uh, articles could have been used because it was in their religious practice, which we don't understand. You know, yeah. it's, it's, uh, it's passing off um, uh, scientific research for, uh, for nonsense. Uh-huh. And um, David Hatcher Childress, uh, uh, the, the, polyri- the, the, the prolific author of the Lost uh, uh, Cities book series, uh, uh, also um, has reported on other cases that the uh, Smithsonian Institute apparently uh, also lost. And um, similar conclusions were, uh, were claimed by French scientist uh, Jacques Berger, who was yeah. born in Russia as Yakov Bergeyer. He reported that the vaults of the Smithsonian Institution are also full of crates containing amazing objects that, uh, that no one is now studying. He also claimed that the situation existed in other museums. I, I personally contend that many marvelous uh, relics remain in storage, uh, like I said, at museums or similar uh, institutional agencies, simply because they do not fit with the prevailing beliefs. Yeah. Yet these relics may be more important than many of the items that are actually on display at the museums. It, well, it's it's sad. That. But, you know, I remember there was the stories, too. I think they're in your book about, uh, was it Egypt or somewhere where they found these little, very small things that look like airplanes or like jets? As a matter of fact, that, that's uh, exactly the case. Uh, there was uh, one found in, uh, in 1898 uh, at Saqqara, and uh, it was cataloged by the uh, Cairo Museum as item number 6347, uh, which identified it as a... Bird. A bird. Uh, but that model plane, uh, which dated to about 2000 BC, along with several others, very very similar uh, 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 models, uh, were were later reexamined in 1969, and um, they all uh, incorporated a correct dihedral angle of uh, wing attachment with uh, aerodynamically designed proportions that were deemed ideal for football. And yet these were birds, uh-huh. you know, so, which, is, which is, you know, ludicrous. Yeah, it's um, ridiculous, but the, the ones I've seen look like jets, but they could also be said to look like spaceships, too. Well, there, there was a, a Delta wing, um, a gold uh, trinket. Uh, that was a South American um, uh, artifact that um, literally, if it was blown up, um, you know, to full size, would have been a very, very uh, um, uh, similar design to our Delta, Delta uh, ships, our Delta craft, uh, a Delta wing craft. And, wow. uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, all of these things seem to be deliberately ignored because they do not fit with the conventional uh, paradigm, um, you know, explaining our... Uh, our past and uh, our history, you know, the way they perceive our history. It, exactly, Dolores. Exactly. But you know, you probably know also. I think wasn't it somewhere in Egypt? I don't think it was at a pyramid. It was one of the tombs where they had the carvings above the door that looked like helicopters, uh, jets, uh, submarines. There was a whole series of them. You probably know and, what I'm talking about. Y- yes. Um, uh, the that was at uh, at Abydos, and um, um, some of the hieroglyphics, um, along with the, the petroglyph um, 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 images, have never been able to be deciphered. That's some of the oldest uh, hieroglyph- hieroglyphics um, known in, in Egypt, and um, um, there are there are images, uh, you know. Uh, in, engraved, carved on, in stone that are truly depictions of modern uh, Apache uh, helicopter uh, um, aircraft. Um, and also, if uh, those familiar with, uh, as, as everyone is, with uh, the Star Wars uh, uh, movies, the, uh, the land speeders of, of Star Wars fame, um, 
it's it's uncanny how how craft uh, aircraft um, you know is is a somewhat again common uh, depiction in ancient times, and this isn't these are not crude uh, drawings or, or crude carvings. These are accurate depictions of uh, more modern day uh, craft. They're very exact, the ones I've seen. They're very, very guess, much so, uh, Dolores. But it's, their um, explanation for them doesn't make any sense. Per- precisely. So you know, looking at the obvious, what it looks like, they describe it as something totally different. Or they really completely mean. ignore it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, more and more, that seems to be the uh, the, the the way that they, they choose to deal with uh, such uh, anomalous artifacts. Oh. It's you know, rather, uh, rather disheartening. Along that same, same uh, line, um, there are artifacts that can't be so well hidden, and those are the, uh, the megalithic uh, structures uh, from ancient times. And, yes, um, I've, I've been to several of these. You can't very well hide them. <laughs> but they it's still precisely give, the case. <laughs> they still give different explanations for them. But go, go ahead with that line. With, with with the uh, the uh, uh, megalithic uh, structures. Go go ahead. Oh okay. Well, um, we we can uh, we can look at uh, obviously Egypt to start with, and uh, the the uh, uh, Khafre pyramid, the the middle pyramid of the three uh, Giza pyramids, um, are one of those structures that definitely it was built um, in in different phases. And it appears as though its its uh, first several base courses of megalithic stone um, are are much much predate the the uh, the later completion of the middle uh, um, uh, pyramid. And um, there are indications that uh, perhaps it was even started before the uh, the great flood of 10,500 BC. Uh-huh. And it was now the middle pyramid has the um uh valley temple um and and uh uh sphinx uh temple and the sphinx sitting in front of it and all of those the sphinx sphinx temple and and valley temple uh also show uh, uh a much greater age for construction than what uh, egyptologists um give it um now, an, a, a, another similar construction of, from more ancient times is uh, is the Osirian, in, also in Abydos. As a matter of fact, we were just talking about the anomalous uh, carvings from Abydos. The Os- Osirian is located in Abydos, and uh, this this particular phenomenal temple uh, is incorrectly thought to have been uh, a lower level segment of the Seti I temple since it was situated below into the rear of that much younger structure, uh, which was known um, to have been built uh, during the time of Seti I, around 1300 B.C. Uh-huh. But definitely the Assyrian was much older, much, much uh, earlier in its uh, construction. It has the largest megalithic limestone and, and granite blocks found throughout Europe, or, excuse me, throughout Egypt. Egypt. Um, the moat that surrounded the central uh, mezzanine was enclosed by a 20-foot thick rectangular wall of red sandstone, and it was cut and fit, fitted uh, in the distinctive uh, polygonal shape of other ancient edifices, you know, where they just fall together like uh, pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. This was yeah, often done for uh, um, earth, earthquake proofing, so to speak, if there were... Uh, Tremblers, uh, tectonic plate movements, and so forth. The rocks might shift and rumble a little bit, but because of their interlocking nature of their polygonal shapes, they would all fall back into place and uh, reseat, so to speak. Um, yeah, I've so been was... to to Cusco. You know, there they have the, the the cities. You know, that are built with the rocks that are just molded together it, and exactly. the shape fit together. And they said they're so tight. No cement, and you can't even put a credit card between them. But when I was in Cusco, you know, they 
you know, they had the custom back in the early days of any temple. When the Christians came along, they would build a, a cathedral or a church over at the uh, temples to tide them. But in Cusco, they didn't destroy the temple, but they built their uh, church around it. But they had an earthquake there, I believe it was in the 1950s, destroyed the church. And at that time, they saw the temple was inside of it. They didn't even know it was there, you know, the people nowadays. But that exactly. temple survived where everything else just was destroyed. And it was built like that, with the rocks that were all just molded together. It was fantastic. The, the um, uh, structures in, in, in South America are very similar, the, the polygonal shapes. Yeah. And uh, the construction methods are very, very similar to the... Uh, what, what are seen in the oldest phases of the uh, Egyptian uh, uh, constructions. And, you know, I, have uh, a, I have a theory they were all done about the same time period, really, all over I, the world. I, I do agree. I do agree. Um, one, one common tie with all of those structures, the South American and the oldest Egyptian um, uh, structures, they're all devoid of any inscriptions or ornamentation, um, and and that's unheard of in later dynast dynastic Egypt, where pharaohs signed everything. Everything was done in the honor of the the pharaoh at the time. Yeah. So um, my gosh, uh, uh, flower pots, um, walking sticks. I don't care what it was in Egypt, they were engraved. They always had. Um, um, you know, some some script, some writing on them, and yet these oldest structures are are devoid of any of those inscriptions, uh, dedications. Um, you know, it, it's uh, it again, it's kind of a common tie. In other words, whoever built those earliest oldest structures uh, had no desire to be lauded to be worshipped, to be praised. Uh, yeah. It was they, they, The structures were built, obviously, for some purpose, which we really don't know even to this day. Uh, their true purpose, they were not tombs in, in the yeah. case of pyramids. Yeah, uh, there's never that. been a human body found in a, in a tomb, in, yeah, in, a, in, a, in a pyramid, excuse me. Yeah. They, they definitely were not, not tombs in the pyramids. I, I can, exactly. I, yep. Yeah. So I agree with you on all of those things. That's why I published your book, because I agreed with everything in there. But, <laughs> well, um, I appreciate that. <laughs> and I Go always, ahead. when somebody knows they're, you know, what they're talking about, too. But let's see, we've got some more time here. Was there something else, that another, another part of that that you wanted to bring out? We well, talked about um, the, the, with, with the exception of uh, some of the megalithic uh, uh, construction sites, uh, most of the anomalous artifacts are, are single or, or standalone items. And um, what I mean by that is no other relics are found within the site. Um, virtually, the, their sites are devoid of any indication of a cultural development, let alone an advanced society that would be capable of producing these anomalous artifacts. Uh -huh. So uh, a possible lost civilization can be eliminated as their source um, since there's no trace of a, of a pre-culture buildup leading to such an advanced society or of a later society itself that would have produced those, those articles. Rather, um, such lone artifacts, uh, to me at least, would indicate perhaps a dropped item by a temporary visitor or perhaps components of a, a, a probe or data collecting sensor sent to our planet, as uh, you know we previously discussed, uh, Dolores. Yeah, so um, I would, like an explorer of some kind. It, exactly, exactly, and and perhaps uh, they had to move, uh, leave quickly. Uh, they you know dropped some of their equipment, or the equipment was expendable, and um, you know rather than taking that added weight back with them or, or whatever the case, uh, we'll just leave it here. It's served its purpose. And, uh, but, but there's no indication of a culture prior or, or uh, extant at the time of the, 
the artifacts that would indicate um, they, they were built here on Earth or manufactured on Earth. Uh, wow. Matter of fact, the, the more likely scenario uh, finds otherworldly uh, beings occupying our planet, perhaps as temporary lodging while their home planet uh, purged, uh, you know, effects from a planetary cataclysm or whatever, or even an unsuccessful attempt at uh, permanent colonization of, of Earth by uh, by alien uh, beings. Oh. Um, I, again, purely speculative, but. Uh, it, it's it's a temporary type visitation, uh, you know, that, that's indicated by these uh, these articles. Um, you know, I know in your book you go way way back, you know, to the very beginning and beyond, you know, to to bring this forward about all of the well, you know the speculation, but a lot of it is based on research and fact, dealing with the uh, the the seeding and the beginning of Earth, you know, when people were first put here and then bring it forward, you go into a lot about that because, you know, I also write about the fact that there is no missing link. They have never found one, that everything happened, evolved so fast that it just jumped whole generations. And um, you go back to a lot of that also. And I, I completely I, I agree mean, with, with your here. statement, Dolores. <laughs> okay. I might be skipping around, but go ahead. You know, go ahead. I know you. I think you came to the same theories that I have, anyway. Well, it. it um, I, I. I agree that there's. Uh, when it comes to a missing link, I don't see a missing link at all. Um, it, it. We. We have a. A. Uh, a very different. Um, emerging. Um, uh, species. As, as humans on this planet than what conventional theories seem to dictate. Um, it, it just doesn't quite make sense with the, the uh, uh, geological and uh, anthropological uh, um, uh, evidence and record that, uh, that exists. And, and in speaking of this, this temporary type uh, visitation by, by uh, extraterrestrials, if, if that be the case, um, uh, there are a number of nails that were also found in, uh, embedded in rock or uh, coal seams, coal lumps, etc. And uh, nails are not used for megalithic uh, stone construction, but they are used for wood construction. And um, these nails that go back to, again, um, you know, perhaps 26 million years ago, um, would, to me, indicate temporary structures uh, put together using wooden nails, wood and nails, um, for, again, temporary lodging um, yeah, or and that way know, shelter or whatever. Yeah, that, that way the, the wood would have deteriorated over the years. Per, but they precisely. Don't. Yep. Yeah. And, and, and that uh, would all, you know, all plant materials would turn into coal anyway. It, over exactly. I was just just going to say the the ferns would uh, would would bury the uh, the rusty uh, nails then after the wood deteriorated, and uh, with heat pressure and uh, many many millions of years, uh, we have our tertiary uh, coal uh, uh, seams from from the ferns. So uh -huh. it's uh, now now. Again, um, all of these anomalous artifacts are only supportive evidence uh, suggesting otherworldly intervention during Earth's ancient past. But the trilogy is, is much more than a review of out-of-place uh, anthropological, yeah. geological, and archaeological relics. Uh, yeah, it, I know it, you're, you're saying that it is just an assumption, but I think you really prove your case very well. Yes, and in the first book, it's full, it has a lot about artifacts and about the history of, of man on down. Then I've just finished reading the second book. That one, uh, uh, you were amazing with me because you have found <laughs> records that, like, just one of a kind. That I, I appreciate I, that. It was, uh, I, I'm, I'm smiling as you say that, uh, Dolores, because uh, I, I, I was very fortunate to stumble across some of those uh, uh, references, some of those uh, uh, ancient texts 
that um, no one, and I mean no one, has found. I and, know that, um, but it was because some of these, they were just one tablet in existence. And these are much, much older than the ones that Zachariah Sitchin has written about. His work kept more up into the Sumerian times, but you went back really to the beginning of the planet with some of the things you have found, the history. And absolutely. And, and I've never heard of some of these references at all. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because this will be the second book, which is Legacy. Isn't what the name of it? Le- Legacy? Legacy of the Elder Gods. Legacy mm-hmm. of the Elder Gods. Right. <clears throat> and I know someone emailed us uh, not very long ago and said, well, uh, you said you're doing a second book. I can't imagine what's in it. There was so much in the first one. <laughs> Well, I, I, again, I appreciate that. Uh, they, my, my intent. See, that's what I mean. You found things that I'd never heard of, of before. But yet, I uh, mentioned some of these uh, references that they're just like one of a kind that have never been written about before. Well, they're, um, um, they're excerpts in much later texts um, of lost ancient manuscripts and um, uh, right offhand, I, I I I don't have any of my uh, my notes or or uh, uh, yeah. uh, and and I can't think of any. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I was yeah, just well. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know there's not, not, so much information; it'd be impossible to keep it all in your head. It um, I I could not agree more with that. Uh, if anyone <laughs> actually took the time to look at the uh, the reference uh, pages uh, in uh-huh. in all three of the volumes, uh, uh, it takes up a goodly portion of the uh, the, the book. <laughs> there, well, I, uh, I know you you did say that you wanted to write all three books before you found the publisher, didn't you? That that is also correct, uh, Dolores. It was extremely important to me. To be consistent throughout all all the uh, the volumes, and um, um, other authors uh, have not done that um, in in that same manner. And uh, there are some inconsistencies from one volume to another uh, in some cases, and I wanted to uh, try to avoid that in in my particular case. Plus, yeah, so I'm I'm a stickler for uh, you know, for, you're for not... facts and, and consistency and uniformity, so uh, that that was another reason. The uh, the first volume, just just to uh, make a point, um, the first volume undoubtedly I went overboard because my intent of the first volume was to make it the the Bible, um, the 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 encyclopedia, um, to throw out every every aspect. Um, Associated with the ancient astronaut theory, um, and and give as much detail as possible in a condensed basis to um, to make sense and you know to offer the the supportive evidence and uh, suggestive evidence um, of of my theory, the Elder God's theory that I I came up with, and uh, hence the second volume then goes into more detail. In some of the, uh, the you know, in, in specific areas uh, that is not covered in the first, um, since the first is a, uh, uh, again, kind of the encyclopedia. It's a, uh, you know, a little bit of everything in it, uh, uh-huh. in, a, in an organized and, and uh, orderly fashion, of course, as uh-huh. an engineer would. <laughs> uh, naturally, that's why you would do it that way. But uh, you know, in the second volume too. You've come up with the same the same same theories that I have, like about the planet that was destroyed, and this became the asteroid belt, and that it did destroy the atmosphere on Mars. All of this I've written about in my own books, and you talk about for the survivors, you know, came. That's what I liked about it because even though we come from different directions, we have found the same information, you know, about the yeah, asteroid I, I, and what happened with that. There's a, a great deal of a great deal of commonality, commonality between uh, um, you know our our, uh, our writings, uh, Dolores. Yeah. When it, when it, uh, one one thing that I should clarify for your listeners, um, speaking of the the outer planet, 
Um, we, we, yeah. we are talking two different species of otherworldly beings that, yes. uh, according to my theory, the Elder God's theory, um, visited Earth in ancient times and um, greatly affected uh, Earth's development and humans, hum, humanity's um, um, uh, ancestry. And uh, one is one species would be the elder gods that I, I refer to, the ancient ones that That's came what I call from. Them. I call them the the ar I, archaic I, ones. Uh, the archaic ones, but it's the same thing. It, exactly, exactly. Oh. And these came. Uh, the, these are the true um, extraterrestrials, the true aliens to our world. Uh, the second uh, species of extraterrestrials came from within our own solar system, where life first started within our solar system on an outer planet. Yes. And very candidly, there just simply is insufficient evidence to, to show or prove um, which outer planet is, uh, is the home world of uh, this solar system, uh, a human-like species that I that I, uh, I talk about in in the Elder Gods, um, well, in in the uh, Elder Gods theory. Yeah. And um, the most likely, well, the, the the two best candidates are Mars and Melbeck. Melbeck being the uh, planet that once the, the once occupied the, uh, the the fifth orbit uh, from from the sun, which yeah. is now occupied by the asteroid belt. Yeah. And obviously it was destroyed in at some ancient time, you know, in the remote past. Uh, by all indications, that was around 700,000 B.C., um, certainly in, in that time range. And, uh, uh, I, again, that kind of eliminates the 3,000 B.C. Um, um, it, 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 again, is not meant as a specific... Um, a year that the uh, the planet exploded, but more of a time frame. It wasn't uh, 10 million years ago. It wasn't 3,000 years ago. It was around 700,000 B.C. Okay. And uh, th um, this is uh, yeah, highly uh, detailed in the uh, in the, the, in the book. Uh, yeah, Don, in, in, I'm watching the clock. Um, uh, the one thing I do want to tell the listeners: we are having our third. A transformation conference, and it's going to be held in Fayetteville, Arkansas. And this is coming up on June 13th to the 15th, that weekend. And Don Shorn is going to be one of our speakers, and he's going to be elaborating a lot more on this. And of course, there'll be questions and answers. But um, if you want more information about our conference, go to our website, ozarkmt.com, and find out more about it. But this is June the 13th to the 15th, and it's going to be in Fayetteville, Arkansas, at the Clarion Inn. But now, Don, if anybody wants to contact you, is there a way they can get a hold of you? Uh, yes. Uh, probably the best bet, uh, Dolores, would be through, um, um, through Ozark Mountain Publishing. And okay. uh, that shows, as a matter of fact, on your website as the, uh, the contact information. And then, of course, that can be forwarded uh, uh, from there. Um, okay. If anybody hopefully, emails and just says it's for you, then we will forward it. Okay. That, that and and it. hopefully at some uh, some later date, um, um, I I will be you know establishing uh, uh, a better, more direct means of uh, of contacting the author. But yeah, for right now, that would uh, that that would be the best bet for any of your listeners. All right, but it's Don Shorn. S C H O R N, and the name of the book is The Elder Gods of Antiquity, and this is the first volume of the three set, and uh, it, it is really getting very good reports from the readers. So they keep uh, contacting us, and they really like it, and they were looking forward to the second volume. But if anyone wants to come and hear Don, come to the conference in June in Fayetteville. And you'll get to meet him and all the other authors we're going to have. Okay, well, we're coming down to the end now. And, Don, I want to thank you for coming on the show tonight. 
Well, thank you so much, uh, Dolores, for for having me. It, it's uh, it's been my pleasure. I, I'm I'm no, I'm long-winded. I apologize for uh, for, oh, for going on and on, but uh, I am looking forward to uh, um, the uh, transformation uh, uh, conference. Uh, uh, in fact, I'll be there. Uh, I'll, my uh, presentation will be on Sunday, June fifteenth, uh, uh-huh. in the morning, and uh, very very much looking forward to uh, to that. Okay. No, you did just fine, but I'm going to thank you. And so now I'm, I'm saying good night to everyone. And next week I'm going to be in Atlanta, so they're going to use the show out of the archive. But good night, everybody. Th- thanks again, Dolores. Bye-bye. Okay. If you enjoyed the show, check out more of our other videos, and be sure to subscribe and click the like button. Thank you for listening to the Metaphysical Hour with Dolores Cannon.